Thank you. Attention, attention, please. I'd like to welcome everybody tonight to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'm going to be uh, moderating tonight with Andy. And I want to remind you, most of you already know this, but there are two specific rules for the college. One is no personal attacks. Oh. <laughs> And the other is only one fool at a time. Yeah. <laughs> Tonight's speaker is Dr. Terence Dolan, author of Children of the Kingdom, Bridging Genetics and Islam to Save the Newborns of Saudi Arabia, an academic, scientist, and research administrator in Madison, Wisconsin, nearing retirement, is heavily recruited by a substantial international entity, which turns out to be the Saudi royal family. He and his wife packed their bags for an unexpected adventure and years in Libya as he helped solve the major public health crisis and build the first disability research center in the Middle East out of his side of Israel. The author states, Children of the Kingdom is my memoir, travelogue, and current event story concerning a Middle Eastern society in tradition, the intrigue of an old rich monarchy maintaining a precarious balance with its country's religious extremists, the passions that naturally swirl around, ancient cultural traditions, and emerging genetic science. And there's my wife, Mary Ann, and I, mature Western expats, walking the line between respecting and learning about the culture of our host country and discovering how to enjoy life abroad under a restricted Islamic regime. I'd like to now formally introduce Dr. Terence Stolen, author of Children of the Kingdom, Bridging Genetics and Islam to Save the Newborns of Saudi Arabia. He has books on sale in the back. They're 15 bucks. And uh, we're getting a lot of these guys to so patronize them if you find the topic fairly interesting. Let's give a warm welcome yeah. for the college for Dr. Terence Dolan. We will have a little bit of PowerPoint. If you need to see it afterwards, let me know. Uh, it was because of me forgetting the projector tonight. Okay, uh, it when you. Was, it, was, it was mostly because I didn't let them know that I wasn't bringing a projector. So I, I thought I would come here this evening and completely relax and. Yeah, I need a, about um, a box my experiences with so far I've got three pages of notes on things I shouldn't say uh, I've got uh, a couple of stories that I've crossed off my list and um, I'll admit right out I'll admit right out that uh, I have been a Democrat most of my life uh, I was personal science advisor, Eunice Kennedy Shriver, for 17 years in addition to other activities. Uh, her husband, Serge, and I have uh, shared in about 700 martinis. <laughs> so, some of them were in you know, Russia when we were starting Special Olympics or whatever. In, in any event, um, I started out life getting a PhD, I'm not a physician, getting a PhD in what's called neuroscience. Uh, I actually got a PhD in psychology, and I told Marianne, my wife Marianne is in the back here, I told Marianne when I finished my PhD I had bad news. Uh, I didn't learn anything I wanted to learn. It wasn't psychology that I was really interested in. I was interested in not in studying what goes in the brain here and comes out here. But I was interested in what happens when it's in that box, what's going on in there. And so I went back to school for three more years and studied uh, what's going on inside the brain. Uh, and I have spent most of my life actually not doing much research. I ended up doing more administration. Um, <coughs> I was head of several organizations, and uh, all in the science community. 
uh, but I've had I've had a lot of interesting things in this book I'm about to tell you about is the first of a couple of books I'm working on. Uh, I was at the University of Wisconsin in Madison for 20 years in the medical school, and I was director of what turned out to be the largest research center in the world on genetic diseases in kids, newborns, toddlers, infants, etc. And after that period of 20 years, you don't have one in the hand. I started getting phone calls from a headhunter wanting to know if I was interested in a different position. She said she had a client that wanted to talk to me. And I said, uh, well, who is it? What do they want me to do? And she said, I can't tell you that until you'll express some interest in this. And I said, I'm sorry, I don't have any interest in it. Uh, I'm legitimately involved in things that I find very interesting. And she called, this headhunter, called about every two weeks for a long period of time. My wife and I would go to bed every night wondering what country she could be from, what does she want me to do. Must be, we guess it must be an African country. Well, finally, after a couple of months of this, uh, I told this headhunter, this woman, that I would be willing to talk to the person uh, if all I had to do was commit to listening to them and giving them, giving them some feedback. Well, it turned out that the person calling me was the king of Saudi Arabia, who was actually his son, uh, Sultan, who was his second oldest at the time. He's now the first oldest, one of his brothers died. So what he wanted me to consider was that in Saudi Arabia, uh, they had a very large number of babies being born that didn't survive. And they didn't know what was going on. They didn't know what they were doing wrong. And I said, well, just go to your, your uh, national office of newborn screening, just like the United States and any other country does it. They, they test the health of every baby that's born. If they have a genetic problem or something like that, and they'll tell you what it is and what you should do about it. And they told me they didn't have a newborn, uh, national newborn uh, health product uh, association. Right. And in fact, most of the countries in the Middle East at that time didn't. So I said, well, I'll come over and look at your situation and we'll talk. So I went over there and I got very interested in it, partly because not only did they not have a newborn screening program. They didn't have any research on infants and toddlers. Uh, they didn't know what was going on with these kids. And they, a lot of them were sick, a lot of them were dying. Uh, so I decided, Marianne and I decided, we'd go over there for a while and try to figure, try and figure out what they were doing and what they could do about it. Well, we went over there and ended up, we ended up staying about five years. Uh, and it turned out to be an extraordinarily interesting uh, experience. Uh, almost all of it is described in this this book that I published uh, last last year. Uh, so, what I wanted to tell you about tonight, as briefly as I could, is just some of the things that we learned over there, what we were doing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, turn on this slide. Unfortunately, we can't show you. A, video or a public PowerPoint, so uh, that's got a prince standing there. Yeah. Excuse me. So that, that guy's name Can is it, Sultan, his father's the present king. Thanks. Sultan's an incredibly interesting guy. He was the only uh, Arab ever to go into space. He was a, uh, he was on uh, whatever, whatever flight it was that went up in 1984. Um, oh, okay. He is an ex-fighter uh, pilot. He was trained in the United States. He married a woman from the United States, and they have Thank moved you. to Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, Arabia ever since. He came back. The next slide is uh, 
part of my part of my research team. It's my wife. It, it is my wife, right? Yeah. My wife, Mary Ann, and our youngest daughter, <coughs> uh, Megan. And I asked Megan, she wanted to come with us. And I said she could if I could put her to work. I wanted to have in the book information about what it was like to be a, 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 a child in Saudi Arabia. I was particularly interested in why women didn't go to college as much as they do as they did at the time. And I was interested in why the parents were so involved in, in getting them married to a particular person. It turns out, by the way, I'm not going to talk about it now, but there are more women going to college in Saudi Arabia right now than men. And secondly, uh, almost all of the marriages, many of the marriages, uh, the parents don't have nearly the say that they used to in terms of who their daughter is. <coughs> going to marry. Next one. All right. Uh, I'm sorry. No. Nope. So I just wanted to say a couple words about Saudi Arabia. Um, it's a country that's about 380 some thousand square miles and that compares to the U.S. of about 3 million square miles. Um, and it's, for the most part, a country that was not inhabited, not developed at all until about 1935. In the 700s, they signed some agreements with some large uh, religious organizations, um, uh, Muslims. And in truth, I think, in many ways, that's at the basis of the root of a lot of the problems that Saudi Arabia is having right now. They made an agreement with a group of, uh, of Muslims called Wahhabs. And the Wahhabis were conservative, and they made a deal with the, the, the royal family that they would be supportive of the royal family in all non-religious issues, but that they had to do what the Wahhabis told them to do in terms of religious issues. And that worked out fine for a while, but right now, in fact, there are a lot of different ways to think about um, the Muslims. And there are two or three different sects. Uh, some of them are more conservative and some less conservative. And the royal family to this day is fighting for uh, a different role, if you will, in, in terms of that religion. Um, what is next? Well, the other thing I probably should say is that until hmm, 70 years ago, Saudi Arabia was an incredibly uh, undeveloped nation. In 1935, there was uh, very few roads. There were very few urban areas. Uh, the deserts mainly uh, were the home for most of the people that lived in Saudi Arabia. Um, there was no constitution. There was no law. It was essentially a country that was in the Middle Ages. Now, you and I know that when we were in the Middle Ages, maybe two or three hundred years ago, uh, it took us two or three hundred years to get to where we are now. Saudi Arabia uh, simply didn't exist in terms of a civilized nation. I said that even now, but a civilized nation. In 1938, uh, money started coming out of the ground, oil. The Saudis didn't know what the value of oil was, and uh, the British and the Americans took almost all of the resort, all of the money that came from the oil until the early 1950s. And in 1950, uh, the Saudis figured out that maybe they should be involved in that as well. And so they started uh, hiring architects, hiring engineers. And when I started going over there, 
almost 20 years ago now. Uh, everybody I saw on an airplane that was from the United States were architects. Yeah. It was just amazing uh, the amount of development going on in, in that country at that time. In the, the next slide, sorry, come on, don't worry about it. It's, it's, is that a picture of the city? Yes, it is. Uh, when I went over there for the first time I've been there in times. Uh, 2000, <clears throat> um, went there. That's, uh, that yeah, city was the, the, the first big city they had built, it was Riyadh, and at this time it has nearly 7 million people. When I got there in the year 2000, they were just starting to build it. So they've, they've developed incredibly rapidly in many ways. They still have a long ways to go. They really don't have much of a constitution. They do have highways running around the country. Uh, there's probably not a fence in Saudi Arabia, so there can be a lot of uh, disagreements on who owns what property, and et cetera, et cetera. But in general, uh, they're making headways as fast as they can. I think one of the other problems they made is that they, the, the family, when they came out of Kuwait in uh, 1901, and they went around the country and essentially took over their country, they named it after themselves, Saudi or Saudia, uh, Arabia, which is the, the name of the tribe, the Saudi tribe, tribe. And so now they really don't know how to get out of it. And they essentially own everything. The oil is there, the natural resources are there, and the people want their share of it. In truth, the royal family, among its other serious problems, doesn't really know how to move forward. Give me here. Yeah, please. That's it. There's some pictures of the land. Who does it? Where is it? That's it. Okay, so when we first went over to Saudi Arabia, as I said, there was essentially nothing there. And there are, going south out of Riyadh, uh, it's all sand, as shown in this picture. And the next picture is also uh, sand. Camels and sand. Camels, okay. Uh, I got a couple of these pictures just to show you uh, some of the more interesting facets of the environment. Uh, for example, the camels. The camels are loose all over the country. There are no <coughs> brands on them. There are no extenu extenuating s spots or marks to identify them. But they all are free to roam, and they all belong to uh, Bedouin. Uh, even though they all seem to know whose camel is whose, uh, you can't see any marks on these camels. But to give you an idea of how many there are, there are tens of thousands of the camels wandering uh, the, the, the desert, if you will. Uh, the worst place you can run into them is the golf course. <laughs> they, they think they own go, the land, and I guess for all intents and purposes, they do. Oh, if you hit a golf ball in between the legs of a camel uh, play, that's why you're playing, you can go up, you can holler, you can shout, you can wave your arms. The camel will just play look at you. He's not going to move a foot on your behalf. So you just have to go up and walk between his legs and kick your ball off so you can keep playing. Uh, the other the other slide was the one with some vehicles. That's the next one. Maybe it was the last one. Just, uh, no, it wasn't. Why not let the camel just play through? Okay, this one is a mountain. It's the other way around. <laughs> mountain right there in their cars in it? No. Oh. Okay, well, anyway, the, well, one of the ones you saw a minute ago big. had automobiles. Box. And in Saudi Arabia, uh, other than the Mercedes and the Lexus, People either have a pickup, a Toyota pickup, 
or they have uh, a Toyota Land, Land Cruiser. And the reason they buy the Land Cruisers is that the vehicles are made to be used, bought and used in Saudi Arabia. Um, the pattern in between the driver's door and the whatever has a refrigerator and a freezer. There are two different uh, gasoline gasoline tanks in it. There's a very elaborate uh, uh, system to tell you where you are and where you've been. Because the problem is, once you get out of the desert, once you go over a, a hill or something, you have no idea where you are. And every year, there's always several, usually Americans, that go for a drive in the desert and never show up again. <laughs> all, all of these vehicles are equipped so you can retrace your, your steps in order to get out of the desert. Next slide. Uh, sorry? Next one's a camel. Next one after that. Jen, have Mary come up and you can just advance it. Okay. Yeah. Mrs. Nolan, could you advance these for us, please? I'm sorry, what was the question? How do they retrace? Oh, they retrace their steps, literally. I mean, that's how they find it. They retrace the way they got in there. Yeah. Okay, so what's the next one? It's on mine. This space bar. Where? On mine, up there. Up here. Up here. Space bar. Okay, you got the one that says mission right now. Oh, okay. So why why did we go over there in the first place? As I said earlier, it was to solve a problem they had with uh, inborn genetic problems. And so we were over there to try and ascertain why so many of these infants were sick, why so many of them were dying, uh, what these diseases were, and what could be done to solve their problem. Excellent. Next slide. The operational plan. Okay, so the operational plan. Okay, it's to identify the birthing sites. Oh yeah, in order to answer those questions, we had to, first of all, find out where all these babies were being born to identify the birthing sites. And recruit and train personnel. And when we got there in 2000, uh, there were about 400,000 births a year. By the time we left, there were 500,000 births a year. So it was a country that was growing rapidly. The problem was, in order to ascertain the health and the problems behind the ill health of a baby, you had to go to where the baby was born, to get a blood sample, to do a variety of other things, and then bring those, the findings from that effort, back to our laboratories and re So you had to explain stress shipping. Yeah. And then we would have to arrange to have all of those uh, things shipped to our laboratories, if you will. The problem is that when you went out of our house in Riyadh and went south, uh, for all intents and purposes, there was nothing. It was 330,000 square miles of sand. And the only people that lived in the mountains in the in the desert were uh, the Bedouin. Bedouin, thank you. Also, um, you arranged with the shipping company, what was the name of the company, yeah. so to go we, out to the villages? Yeah. So we weren't in a position where we were going to drive over 300 and some thousand miles. Ooh. And in the north part of the country, by the way, uh, up above the, the, the top third, 
is about 250,000 square miles of sand. Now there were they were building roads, and the, the dead ones, many of them had a, a a pickup, but that was how primitive it was in the year 2000. Well, you're showing a map of Saudi Arabia, which people aren't going to be able to see anymore. Okay, so uh, this was just to show you uh, how small the populace was. A lot of those towns, in fact, are are villages. Okay. Yeah, and, and if you can't see anymore, then that, no. that's it. So you now want to talk about what you're screening for. Oh. What, are you, what, did, what are you screening for? Genetic diseases. In this country, there are about 80 or 90 what are called inborn errors, genetic diseases, and what causes them is that the genes don't work the way they're supposed to, and I'll explain that in a second. And so what we were trying to do is to ascertain what those diseases were. And what's the next one? So you, uh, so the diseases are often caused by faulty transference. Okay, so I'm going to show you a slide in a minute how genes actually work. It's not going to be particularly scientific. But when a man and a woman marry, and the man impregnates the wife, he has a set of chromosomes with uh, genes in them, and the woman does. And he has mostly, well, he has uh, all male chromosomes. She has one chromosome for woman and one for man. And what happens, those DNA merge and interact with each other. Part of the, of the gene of a man interacts and goes into the genome of the woman. And then the next thing that happens is that those now integrated genes integrate with another set of genes that are called RNA rather than DNA. And the reason they're called messenger RNA is that they determine what those genes are now going to reproduce, what they're going to make. They're going to either make proteins, or they're going to uh, make enzymes, or they're going to make uh, acetylcarnitines. And it's those products that then develop the infant, develop the human. And so if they as, long, as long as they develop the material they're supposed to, the infant will grow normally. However, uh, there are a lot of things that will screw up that process. And in genetics, one of the main ones is something in which uh, the right protein or the right enzyme wasn't made. I'll give you an example. In this country, one of the most common genetic diseases is something called phenocatenuria. Phenocatenuria is a disease in which the baby is born apparently uh, fairly normally, but within a year or two, uh, the baby has developmental problems, eventually becomes mentally retarded, and within a few years will probably die if nobody does anything about it. Now, in fact, phenylcatenuria is a disease, you don't cure it, but you control it. control it so that it doesn't cause any problems for the child. And the way, what, what happens is that the gene didn't produce an enzyme to eat up the excess uh, enzyme that's going into the baby. Through food. Sorry? Through the food. Yeah. Well, yeah the, the food is an enzyme. It's actually a, it's an enzyme that is in most food, but the gene makes an enzyme that will eat up that excess uh, enzyme so that the child will develop normally. As I said before, in this country, there are 80 or 90 such diseases. One of the things that went wrong for us in Saudi Arabia is that they didn't have 80 or 90 of these kinds of problems. They had about 160. 
and their genes don't operate the same way that ours do. So right off the bat, we had a, a variety of problems. I just want to say one more thing about the disease that Terry was just describing. If, in fact, and in this country, it, because we do all the testing on newborns, it is detected very early. The child is then put onto a special diet and they can grow up to be a normal child. And even now, eventually, can, there's a possibility of them no longer having to consume these special foods that they were put onto as an infant. So it's, I, I, it's almost like a miracle that before they would die, or they'd become uh, mentally and physically uh, compromised. And in fact, now it's just a matter of eating the right foods in order for them to develop normally. <coughs> okay, uh, your most serious challenge. Okay, so when we got there, as I say, there was nothing to build anything on it. So, uh, it took us about, well, we had to hire and train about 190 people the first couple of years that would go out and get these samples from these babies, bring them back to our laboratories, etc. Uh, I, okay, I'm going the wrong way. You just hit the space bar. It advances it forward. So okay. what the next side is it? Well, you now have why Mary Cousin. Well, no. I, I would like to say that. Okay. Okay. I want to talk about the fact that when you set up your lab, you hire women. Do you have cream? No, I, I don't think I have cream. But what Marianne would like me to point out right now, I'll pick up the pace here, is that when I went over there, there were no women working in any of the programs or facilities that I saw. I'm going to throw you some extra money for tonight. And so when I was talking to the prince, I asked him why he didn't see any women in the laboratory. He said that hiring women was a problem because the citizenry had obligations, I mean, had objections to it. And I said we were going to start a program for children were infants and their families, or the mother, and if I, they weren't going to allow me to hire women, then I was just going back to the airport and leaving. I couldn't imagine not hiring women. So he said, well, the thing is that it's okay for women to be hired, but they have to be in separate parts of the building and do all different laboratories. And so I said, well, I didn't see how I could do that. The way I ran a large facility is that we would have men and women and I would have them integrated in order to do some of the things we were doing. And when I first went there, uh, they asked me how much was it going to cost to do all these things. And I said, well, we gave an estimate of about $150 million to get it off the ground. And in fact, about 10 days later, I had a bank account with 150 million in it, so uh, resources wasn't the big problem. Either. But it was not our money. Right. <laughs> um, and the other thing was, I, I didn't have a building, and they said, well, we'll give you a building, you don't have to take the cost of that out of your, your account, if you will. And in fact, they, now, they put us in a building that was a huge building, and they divided it into two parts, one for men and one for women. And then at the junction of those two buildings, there was a big... Uh, atrium. Atrium, thank you. And my office was just outside that atrium. And uh, during the day when we would have men and women working together, I would have us all get together in that big atrium. And I had a... I had a uh, alarm built put in that went to the front entrance of the building and I trained all the people if someone came in that they didn't know who it was 
and it looked like it could be what's called a Mutawa. A Mutawa is a religious re police. A religious police, if you will. Uh, so then they would push a button, and the alarm would go off in our atrium, and all of the women would go in one direction, and all the men would go in another direction. <laughs> and ten minutes later, they hear the alarm again, and they'd all come back and say, "What are you?" I will have to say though that in the larger hospitals, that in fact the men and women do work side by side. It was just that he, the prince, didn't see how it could be done in this particular situation. Okay, positive expectations, an increase in number of diseases okay, being okay, screened. I so I, I, I'm going to try and wrap it up. This is taking too long, but you uh, you still got some time, about 10, 15 minutes, if you need it. Um, so they only wanted you to screen for 14 diseases. Well, yeah, when I started, uh, I had to meet with the, what they call the <coughs> Ministry of Health. They didn't have one, really. And they wanted to know how many diseases that I wanted to screen for. And I said, in the United States, we're screening for about 60 right now. And I want to get as many as possible in the, in front, right from the start. And they pointed out that they would only be willing to screen diseases if they could do something about it once they learned that the child had it. So, uh, in fact, they only had about 14 diseases that they thought they could intervene in some way. So we only started out screening 14 diseases. So we had 190 people traveling all over the country to bring back samples from babies for 14 different diseases. Uh, to this day, it keeps growing, <coughs> and our hope is that the 14 is now 20. Hopefully next year it'll be 30, and we'll continue to grow that list. Uh, but that's the, the main point is that, that the more that we increase that list, the more ba babies we're going to find, the more babies we find, the more diseases we'll be able to intervene, intervene for, so that instead of saving 14, 15, 20, 25 babies a year, we'll get it up to where maybe we're saving dozens and dozens and dozens of those. Of those I babies. just wanted to interject one thing at that in uh, regards to what Terry is saying. Also, um, the Saudi Arabia is rather paranoid about information for whatever reason, or for whatever subject, leaving their country. So Terry got very excited about all the discoveries he was going to be making in different diseases. There are diseases there that do not occur here. So it was like this giant country was one big lab for him. Well, that was very quickly crushed because the findings <coughs> were not going beyond their borders. So that. That was a big disappointment for us. Okay, I know you can't see it, but this is the picture of the uh, center, which was, a, a, I would have to say, a typical Middle Eastern um, design. It was a beautiful building, um, but you know, you you really you really can't see it. But I love the idea that the buzzer would go off at the front door if somebody yeah. sketchy came and the ladies would go one way and the men would go the other. And that just tells about order in your book. Okay, well, my part of this presentation is done. I don't know All right. The next part will be our question and answer period. Okay. Um, Andy, you want to get up there and help him out or do you just want to call people? Right. Let's thank him. We're going to ask his wife to accompany him on questions. The first one I'd like to ask you personally is that are you a Cubs or a Sox fan? Uh, it's a loaded one. I saw you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> When I moved to Chicago the first time, thank you. Sam, that's the last time you'd be stupid, all right? Ah. Uh, 
No. I moved here in 71 the first time. Okay. And I became a coach fan, and I have been ever since. Okay. Now, I, I will admit that we often spend the winter in Arizona. Ah. And I, uh, I work for the Cubs in the spring training. Uh, I have a couple of very important jobs. One is if somebody gets hit on the head with the foul ball, I have to go make sure they're alive. <laughs> Secondly, I have to tell them where the bathroom is and where you can buy a martini. <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay. Um, you had said that well, you went there because there are a lot of babies dying. Um, can you, oh yes. Can, can you give some examples of like the different rates of, of infant mortality relative to undeveloped countries and sure. industrialized countries? Sure. That's, in fact, that's a really interesting question for a couple of reasons. First of all, as I said, the main problem, one of the main problems for us was consanguinity. That consanguinity, marrying your first cousin, and in Saudi Arabia. 60% 60 60 of the marriages are among first cousins. 60%? Oh, I, I have a follow-up question. Okay, let me get back to that. Okay, my follow-up question about the 60%, is that, and I guess this is sort of related, but that 60%, is that just the Saudi citizens, or are you, does that figure include the uh, immigrants and um, uh, because I understand it, I understand that, that Saudi Arabia, along with the other Persian Gulf monarchies, has a very high percentage, uh, a very high percentage of its actual population is foreign workers, like 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 like, like you guys. Okay. Is that correct? Yeah, sure. So let me try and answer. What's the percentage that? of the population are foreign workers, and, and, and does the 60 percent apply to them as well, or is it just the Saudi citizens? No. Uh, first of all, there are about 28 million people that live in Saudi Arabia right now. Uh, only about, all but 11 million of them are in fact Saudis. There's about an 11 million chunk of the population that are not Saudis. But 99% of them are Muslims. They're just not Saudis. Sure. Uh, but now to go back to the question here of of uh, diseases. Uh, infant mortality, mortality rates? Infant oh, yeah. Yeah, and they were talking Different about the 60% yeah. of so the if, marriages are cousins. If the married couple are not consanguineous, they're married to someone other than their cousin, uh, the rate of disease in that group is about one in every 1,500 groups. So with 400,000 births, that may be being what, a few hundred people that were. Now the, the ones that are consanguineous, in that group, one in every 1,500, I got it the other way around, one in 1,500 when they're not consanguineous, one in every 300 when they are consanguineous. So right now, with the rate of shares that we're developing, there is about maybe 33,500 something deaths every year, or serious illnesses, and less than, less than a tenth of them would be other than consanguineous births. Uh, but I'll, let me say one other thing about that. The incidence of death and disease caused by consanguinity many years ago in this country was a disappearing problem. That is, in many states in the Union, for example, that was against the law to marry your cousin. Now, in the entire world, the rate of consanguinity is slowly going back up even in the United States. Right now in the United States, the incidence of consanguinity is about 9% of births. And it's slowly going up uh, 1 or 2% every few years. Now, there are a couple of reasons for that. One is that 
the population gets bigger and bigger so that the probability you're going to marry someone, even if they are a cousin, that is going to cause you problems with your offspring is slowly going down. The other thing that's different is that a lot of these are among sects of different religions. So like the, what would be a good example? Mormons? What? Mormons? Mormons, although interestingly enough, they're not going up as fast. <coughs> Some of the R Russian sects, yeah. uh, Mennonites, Sutterites, <coughs> they're going up. So <coughs> it's interesting. And it's no longer against the law in any state, by the way. Uh, they have stopped enforcing that, if you will. Yes. The, 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 the Vatican and Islam were against designer babies. How did you deal with that? What, define designer babies for me. Well, the genetic uh, workup that you do on them. To, oh. to well, first of all, a lot of people, a lot of people think that the uh, the incidence of consanguinity in Saudi Arabia is so high because the the religion, uh, yeah. the, 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 I'm trying to think of, I don't get, what, what are you what's, what, the disease, the, they think that, um, no, your question I don't understand. What are you well, talking it's about? It's Interference? On, it's on the internet. They call them designer babies, the babies you worked on to stop all these infect these diseases and these genetic disorders. Well, they're in utero? Babies. That's in the internet. No, oh, it must not. be true yes, then. Look it up. Yeah. <laughs> That's not what they're doing. That's not what they're doing. Genetic engineering. A lot of the, a lot of the people, particularly in the United think that the reason these people are marrying their first cousins is because it's highly recommended by the social aspect of Muslims, thank you. They think that the Muslims are recommending they marry their cousins. Now the truth of the matter is the Muslims aren't recommending it. Uh, and they still do it, but here's the reason they still do it. Uh, it's all for um, cultural reasons. Um, they think it's good to marry a first cousin because if your offspring is terribly ill, you've got built-in people in the family to help, help take care of the baby. If the if the child has These questions are too long. Sorry. These are taking too long. Oh, the answers. The answers are taking too long. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, there are a lot of different reasons yeah, they're married. A lot of it is tribal and cultural, also. That that is. In the back there. Uh, was Saudi Arabia or, or the kingdom before it? Was it ever part of the Ottoman Empire? Yes. Parts of it. Y yes, yes, but it, it was broken up into a lot of different parts, and that was way back particularly when the British were involved in a lot of other groups, if you will. Does that help? Yeah. 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 Uh, moving on to a slightly different area, how much access does the average uh, citizen of Saudi Arabia have uh, to the monarch or his representative? The reason I ask this is because I understand that it used to be the custom several times during the year where if a Saudi citizen had a request to make of the king, uh, he could do so. Uh, was that true and is that still true today? It's changed in the following way. Uh, up until about 15 years ago, the advisory councils were all men and they were appointed by the king, if you will. Now, those advisory councils are made up of both men and women, and they get elected to those councils. So if you want to make some kind of a claim, you can go to those councils, 
and they will then transmit the <laughs> message, if you will, to whoever they want it to go to. But Patrick, I'm going inter to interrupt. Patrick, I, I know exactly what you're talking about, and on certain days of the week, maybe it was once a month, I cannot remember that, there would be a scribe sitting at a certain point where people, the citizens that had a complaint would go to this scribe, he would write it down with their name, and then he would take all of these suggestions, complaints, requests back to the uh, appropriate person. So and I remember committees. and I remember driving down the street and seeing the people lined up and presenting whatever it is, that their complaint or their wish or whatever to the per to a, an individual, to a man. Did they actually up. get redress? I have no idea. <laughs> I, did, I didn't ask. I didn't follow up. The, uh, you reminded me of another point I should have mentioned. Pew, the Pew Foundation and several other groups are predicting that over the next 30 years, about 3 million uh, Muslims will move to the country. So right now there are 6 million Christian uh, citizens, and there are 3 million uh, Muslim citizens. In, in the 30, next 30 years, according to all of the research I've looked at, there will next there will be about six million each of the Muslims and the Christians in this country. Oh, and if you do if you do the research, uh, conservatives and Republicans are not pleased about this, and liberals and Democrats, the way they vote on these things, don't seem to be nearly as upset about it. Oh, you had the question. Next. Yes. Um, what about like uh, breastfeeding? Do the the women there breastfeed the newborns? And uh, I know they're they have, they don't have the same milk like we do. I mean, do they do like oat's milk and cow's milk? They do the like pasteurized. Oh, I see. Well, milk is different. They, 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 they do do. Yeah, they, yeah they all those above. Uh, the bed ones, uh, you know, their only possession on earth is the camel. But the camel is amazingly. Uh, I mean, when a baby is born, the first thing they do is they wash the infant with camel's milk, because, camel's urine. These are the bed ones. Because it's so good to uh, kill, it's an antibiotic, and it's very effective in that way. Uh, they, use, they use the camel for milk, they use the camel for food, and they use it for... One of the interesting things when you live there is that you'll see a pickup driving down the road with the camel or two in the back. And they sit up very tall looking around. Uh, they're, just, yeah, they're not standing, obviously. No, they're squatting. But when you're, you ask about the milk, we went to one of the best grocery stores. It was a Safeway. So if you're in the city, you have access to these incredible supermarkets. Mm -hmm. of the air. Yeah. They have rows and rows of rice, all kinds of meat and all of that. So we did not, I mean, it, they're not rustic in the city, but if you go out into the desert, of course, that's a whole different story. So how was the camel's yeah. milk? Right. I didn't try it. No? Okay. No. You, you, you can get it out of the Camel milk? Yeah. Sure. Why not? I, I, this, this it wasn't in the grocery store, honey. Divine oh, oh, yeah. I've, seen, I've seen the advertisement store on Divine Avenue. Who cares? Oh, well, well then I guess milk. maybe it was, and I just decided I, was, I wasn't about to try it. With, 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 the next question. Milk. with what I see in this country, with what I see in this country, you know, when women are driving on the toll road or something like this, yeah, would you right. say that Saudi Arabia is maybe an intrinsically safer vehicular-wise oh, since they don't allow women to drive? I don't. Now, as it now, they can drive. Really? Oh, yeah. No. It's kind of yeah, slowly. Yeah, they slowly like they do now, but uh, it's actually yeah. better. No, the yeah. driving is off. Yeah. See, the, the, the thing is, if you, can, if you can 
sit on a camel and turn left from the right lane. Why can't you do that with an automobile? <laughs> <laughs> Farina, you okay. got a hand, um, hand up. You found a solution in a diet for a baby that's already born. Was there any institutions that did genetic counseling for newlywed couples to prevent? Well, that's, a really, that's a really good question. So let me be, be as brief as I can. First of all, when we got there, most people didn't know about the relationship between consanguinity and ill health. So we started a national network of advisory clinics to give pre uh, pre-marital, pre-everything counseling to these. Now, best we could tell, they didn't affect, have any effect on anything. And we think the reason was uh, twofold. One is, we're getting so good at curing genetic diseases that a lot of them will look and say, well, the incidence of me having a sick baby is only one in 500. So I'm going to go ahead and marry my cousin anyway because of the other good things that are happening. Um, right now, so Charlie. Charlie. Genetic counseling before, before genetic counseling to an only good couple prior? Yes, in fact, a colleague of mine has been doing a bunch of research. He's from Australia, but he lives in Saudi now. Uh, his argument was that they shouldn't wait until high school to do that kind of counseling and by the time they're in high school they're thinking about who they're going to marry blah 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 and if they if they did it more in junior high uh, it would be more effective. On the other hand we can't tell them it does anything right now. If a person was pregnant with a baby who she knew was defective, is there ever an abortion? Oh that's another reason. Randy, are you when we first when I'm we, trying. When we first moved there, um, it was not legal to touch the fetus in any way until it was born. In fact, from the day that the fetus was conceived until the day it was born, you could not do anything to that fetus. That's all changed just in the last few years. In fact, it was the, the religious people that got it changed. Too many good things going on that could be done for babies and not being done. Hold on. Charlie, you got the next question. You have a question? Yes, the Crown Prince was recently the runner up for Man of the Year. Did you have any dealings with him? Also, there's a serious crisis in the Amen in which I believe millions of people are presently dying. Do you have any insights into what's going on over there and what this crown prince is doing regarding it in the royal family? That's a really tough question and that takes a while to try and answer, but here's part of the deal. Whatever you had five, I can get two. All right, we don't So anyway, the, the Yemen <coughs> is run by the Shia group of this. That's a different. Muslims. And the their Houthis. enemies are the Houthis. Sorry? It's the Houthis in Yemen. The Sunnis would be, you know, like Saudi Arabia. So the problem is about a month or so ago, the past mayor of Yemen was murdered. And right now, in the Middle East, tensions are as high as they've been for a long, long time between Sunnis and, and Shia. I'm going over there in April for a month, and I'll probably know more of them than I do now. But it's a very difficult situation. Over here. Over here. Uh, I would like to know, any, I would like to know if any organization in Saudi Arabia who is against marriages between cousins, because it's ridiculous. Any organization who is against any organizations? cousins' marriages, it's actually it's ridiculous. Is there any organization against it? Yeah, not that I know of. I mean, it's, it's been part of their culture. But it's, I agree it's very dangerous for genetic if cousins marry. It's, it's very sick. You know, it's not right. Well, that's true in a way. On the other hand, 
the fewer and fewer people are dying because too many high percentage. Um, it's just so it's a it's a part of their culture and. Uh, but then, well, but it's not just the Saudis that marry customers. <laughs> yeah, could you talk a little bit about Wahhabism that the royal family practices and what's that done? What influence does it have on the rest of the country? Another good question. Wahhabism is the most conservative sect of Muslims. And it started in order to help the royal families remain strong because they let the Wahhabis take care of all of the religious things. Now, there are at least three or four different forms of the religion, and the Wahhabis are by far the most conservative. Now, interestingly enough, I've been talking to Muslims in this country and in general, they're not supportive of the Wahhabis, and I suspect it's not Wahhabis that will be migrated. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, one of the things that has kept Saudi Arabia, or at least some people in Saudi Arabia, living high off the hog, of course, has been black gold, oil. Uh, that's, a finite, that's a finite resource. Are any provisions being made to what the country will do after the oil dries up? Or do they go back to being uh, exactly what they were 150 years ago? The answer to that, I think, is that even now, more and more efforts are being expended to take advantage of natural gas. And if you go to the oil fields, as much gas coming out of the ground as there is oil right now. If you go to the shipping yards where they're loading up all of these natural ingredients, if you will, it's already moving over toward uh, natural gas. Also, Patrick, you have to remember that millions and millions and millions of their dollars is invested outside of their country. So they have uh, they have resources outside, monitorial resources outside of their country. In the back. <laughs> Um, That's I you. have a question. Uh, I have a two-part question. Oh, all right. Yes. And uh, you know what? I think what Tim wanted to ask instead of Cubs versus Sox, I think you wanted to ask gin or vodka martini. What's your second question? <laughs> Keep it semi-intelligent here tonight. All right. Get serious. Hold on a second. Okay, so anyway, uh, Saudi Arabia has the biggest military in the Middle East, correct? Do they? Yeah. Can you answer why is that? I think because they're... That's a, tough, that's a tough question. I think it's partly because they're in conflict with almost every non-Sunni country in the Middle East. And ISIS, of course, has changed all that as, as well. And, ISIS now, as you know, is moving a lot of its conflict activities into other countries rather than just in the Middle East, if you will. I don't know if my husband with the, would agree with this or not, but, but I think that as a supporter of the United States, they have a very large military in their country. Yeah. Yeah, I think we have something to do with that. Yeah, they have they're an ally. They're a and you can't have an ally with the National Guard. Yeah. Over here. Um, how do you rate the chances of MBS surviving and keeping the lid on the on the change he's trying to do at the speed he's going back? Do you think he's going to survive or is he going to be moved it off for long? I didn't hear the first part. MBS, um, Mohammed bin, bin Salam. Yes, it's the, the new crown the new, prince. The new crown. Made, is it the enormous new king change. or the crown prince? Hmm? The, the king or the crown, crown prince? prince? Yeah. He's made all these sudden changes, and there's right. some oh, concern that he may not be able to survive. Uh, 
he knows that, he can well, I, you know, <laughs> you know, the truth is, I, I don't have an answer to that. I do, I talk to, I talk to uh, Sultan and his people maybe weekly. And we know that all of our communications are monitored. I mean, he and I know that everything we say, believe me, they know everything we say. Yeah, know about yeah, but, you know, we, we, really, we really don't talk about ISIS. Crown Prince is his brother, of course. Okay. Uh, who hasn't had a question? I have. <coughs> who? I have. Me. Okay, you got one there. All right. <coughs> Were you there during 9 11? Ha! <laughs> flying back there on 9 11. Flying back? We flying were, back to South Africa. We were due to leave that day. So? To go back. <coughs> So did you go back? So you didn't go back. What? So did you go back or not? My husband went back two weeks later. Two weeks later. I had cancer at the time, and I was going to have my treatment in Saudi, but I decided, with everything being so uncertain, I stayed in the states to have my treatment, and then I went back. So what was the reaction of the Saudis to 9/11? What? Some good, some, some not. What was the government's reaction? Well, the, the royal family, of course, right. uh, denied they, denied that they knew or had anything to do with it. And it was sort of <laughs> bad Saudis, if you will. Um, my favorite story is one of my close friends was a neurosurgeon. Uh, and on that day, in Saudi, in Riyadh, he and another, some other people on the team were doing surgery on a guy's brain. And during the surgery, somebody came into the surgical room and announced about the attacks on the village. And a couple of the people in the room cheered. And one guy right across the table from my friend laughed. The guy was out cold before I hit the ground. I could tell Our you. friend knocked him out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. wow. yeah. And we're going to wrap it up here in the next couple minutes. So who hasn't had a question yet? Uh, here. Uh, Jonathan. Jonathan. How many Muslims are okay. here in the United States now, and how many of them are terrorists? <coughs> Let's put it this way. I think there are fewer than some people. You had one question back here? Yeah. And then Jonathan. Are those two synonyms anyway? Right. Right. The production of oil is the main GDP source, right? The main source of income? Close, yeah. yes. Exactly. And uh, I was wondering how much of the gains from production of petroleum trickles down to the little man? That's another really good question. So, in the old days, uh, maybe in the 40s, in the 40s and 50s, a lot more trickle down than trickles down now. And I think it's partly because uh, their educational system is so bad, a lot of people aren't getting educated to really participate in the economy, if you will, of working. Secondly, I think it's because um, they're starting to make more money yeah, oil, gas than oil. And thirdly, I think because the population is growing so fast, there's less money in general to be shared by the people. Although, I have to say, the, the wealth of the kingdom is notoriously high. I mean, it's beyond belief. The, the king himself has a personal wealth of about $3.8 billion. My boss, Sultan, Sultan has two 740s, uh, what's the next one down? Has two huge jets. jets. They have a lot of money. And one of the reasons that there's so much turmoil with this young son that's causing all the turmoil right now 
is that he thinks that they're abusing it way beyond anything reasonable and that part of the unhappiness with the royal family is the extent of which they're spending money way beyond anything reasonable, if you will. But the, the poverty rate is about 40 percent. You know what? The poverty rate. Poverty rate. Yeah, the, the, big, the big problem isn't just the poverty rate. The, pro the problem is that it's about 40 percent of the nation is under the age of 30. And they're the ones that are unemployed. You got to the worst part. So a more serious problem isn't unemployment, it's who's unemployed. But we keep the Wahhabis happy, they get their trickle down royal, right? Say it again. The royal family, the, the royal family uh, keeps the Wahhabis happy right. by giving them money. We don't know that. We don't know. I don't know. Uh, Jonathan, you've been Jonathan, waiting. you've been waiting. Go ahead. Two countries that have a pretty uh, dismal record on the human rights of the disability community are the United States and Saudi Arabia. Uh, could you talk about uh, what you see as a failure on either of those two governments to recognize the self-determination of the disability community? As I walk around inside the brain, I haven't seen anything about that. The truth is, I, I can't respond. I don't know. Okay, last question here then. I don't really understand. In your premise, you said you worked at a disability center, though, so that would be at the center of your scholarship, wouldn't it? Okay. It's like the center. Did you work there? So, you base your statement on what, that the United States is so bad in what? The in, United in, Nations has a declaration of human rights for people with disabilities and two governments doesn't <coughs> agree to sign on to it through international treaties being Saudi Arabia and the United States. See, I, I respond to that. that. I respond to that, but I don't want to start an uproar. All I can say is that the United States is not signed on to a lot of things I think they should have signed on. Okay. 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 Last question down here. Uh, wasn't Osama bin Laden a relative of the royal family? No. No. He was a member of one of the largest families in the kingdom, but they were not relatives. Okay. Let's give a hand to our speakers. All right. All right. All right. You will get the last word. And listen to the rebuttals, and then you will get the last word. Okay. We're going to come up and rebut or uh, clarify. Uh, if you want to. Thank you. One more hand, guys. Come on. Oh. Okay. Uh, we're going to start the uh, the final segment of the program, which is the rebuttal period. So, can we have a show of hands, please, about who wants to give a rebuttal? Keep your hands up and we'll get a count. That way we'll know how many minutes each person gets. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, seven is nine. I count nine hands. Is that right? Let's go about four minutes each. And okay, we'll let's start with four minutes each. Who wants to be first? Up let's here. Uh, okay, Sid. First on the rebuttal. Sid. Sid. <laughs> yeah, put two hands up. You get two, you get, you get twice as much time. Um, yeah, but you don't use it properly. Osama bin Laden, his father came from Yemen. And he was a bricklayer. And he made, I believe he made bricks also in Yemen. And then he migrated to Saudi Arabia and he became the official architect of the Saudi family. And that's why he got so rich after he um, located to Saudi Arabia. Now his son, Osama bin Laden, didn't like the fact that a lot of uh, American troops were stationed in Saudi Arabia. That's the thing that got him really upset. 
And that's why he um, attacked the United States in the, uh, with, with the Twin Towers in New York. Oh, no, that was George W. Bush. That was the reason for it. And, of course, uh, Osama bin Laden also had an army with him. And he developed this hatred. And now what's happening in, uh, in Yemen, in Yemen they have the fifth, fifth uh, fleet of the United States. And the Saudis are attacking that country, Yemen, with planes and killing a lot of them. So uh, another thing about Saudi Arabia that a lot of people don't know, they're always talking about if an American is captured in that part of the world by any of these groups, they behead them. That's not true. Not true. No, absolutely not. But anyways, that's one of the punishments in Saudi Arabia. They cut your head off if they don't like you, or if you're doing something wrong, or maybe they could cut your hand off or something. But uh, essentially, they're under the control of the oil companies in the United States and uh, some other places own a lot of that oil. That's why they're there. You look a little bit red. All right, it's not a recommendation. I was kind of making some notes here as to what the nature of the questions and answers was about. I was just kind of curious. And there seems to be an obsession in this room with marrying or dallying with one's first cousin. Now, the fact of the matter is, most of the crowned heads of Europe come from families that have been doing it for centuries. Uh, I had a friend who lived in Appalachia, and he jokingly, and I emphasize jokingly, because of their reputation, uh, real or imagined, uh, jokingly said, well, at least we know the girl comes from a good family. Right. Uh, no. The fact of the matter is, with modern medicine, oh, incidentally, Franklin Roosevelt married his first cousin. No, he didn't. Uh, Eleanor like Roosevelt? Fifth, she was like a fifth or a sixth cousin. A fifth or a sixth cousin? Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, okay, I stand corrected then. Disgusting. <laughs> Why well, disgusting? Yeah. Cannot, <laughs> anyway, anyway, the fact of the matter is medical science, uh, as was pointed out uh, this evening, has reached the point where fewer and fewer diseases show up as a result of close, uh, you know, cousin uh, marriages. Now, I'm not suggesting that we all go out and uh, start... Uh, start dating our uh, close cousins. I am suggesting that modern medicine has made things possible uh, that may not have been possible 50 or 100 years ago. Uh, I think more important is what is going to happen in Saudi Arabia after uh, the oil dries up, after the gas dries up, and after the royal family has uh, probably seen its day. Uh, there is a growing uh, number of people, I understand, and please correct me if I'm wrong, in uh, Saudi Arabia that uh, would like to see some form of government other than what they've got right now. Uh, whether that becomes a bloody revolution or whether that becomes uh, a uh, reasonable change of government remains to be seen. But the
fact of the matter is, what happens in Saudi Arabia, because of its location, is of crucial importance to the United States and most of the Western world. And we can't say, well, that's in Saudi Arabia, all that is is a desert, and what do we care? Take a look at a map. He who controls Saudi Arabia controls uh, much of that region, if they want to. And uh, they can either be our friend, or they can either be a major problem for the United States and the rest of the Western world. Uh, we need to watch closely what happens. We need to watch closely what the Crown Prince does. So far he appears to be a rather progressive sort. Uh, I understand that just a few months ago they passed a law in Saudi Arabia allowing women to drive. Uh, I don't know how true that is, but if true, uh, that's a step forward. Um, the, fact, the fact that uh, more and more foreigners, Westerners, are allowed into uh, parts of Saudi Arabia that you know would have raised eyebrows not too many years ago, uh, you know, this is, this is important. Uh, we sometimes in this country can get a little bit provincial that if it's not happening in our front yard, it's not important to us. What happens, what happens in the Middle East, whether we like it or not, is something that is already having a profound effect on us. It's something we need to follow very closely and we need to treat people of all parts of the world as we ourselves would like to be treated. This is not to say we become the doormats of the world, but it is to say that some of our old habits of making short shrift of other peoples and other cultures has got to change because we grow smaller and smaller as a world every year. We have to deal with these people. We have to do things uh, closely with these people. We may not like it, we may feel uh, a little bit uh, uncomfortable, but this is something we've got to live with. And incidentally, today it's oil. Right now, uh, we are approaching an age when the real gold of the future is going to be water. Take a look at a map. The largest, the largest fresh water is to be found in the center of the United States and Canada, the Great Lakes. This is something that's going to have a profound effect. I once had a two-star general at a party tell me the next war, major war that's fought, is not going to be over oil, it's not even going to be over land, it's going to be over water. Thank you. <laughs> Next. Water, water. Okay, just give me some water. Um, Saudi Arabia is similar to the United States. Its, it's economy is based on oil. And the United States, of course, everybody was bailed out. The car companies were bailed out because of their connection to oil. And, you know, Trump says there's no global warming, so we're going to keep, we're going to keep buying oil from Saudi Arabia and keep producing oil in, in North Dakota and the tar sands, and, you know, that'll be fine. Everything will be great. Uh, WBBM has traffic reports every 10 minutes just to keep propaganda for oil coming. And um, so it's very nice to keep, to send the medical people all around the world and keep those kids coming. Thank you. Okay. All right. Good doctor didn't explain why Trump was doing that sword dance. Sword dance? Yeah. With the you know, Saudi Arabians, yeah. remember when Trump was got all those swords and everybody was dancing with swords? I don't know anything about that. You don't know about that? See? Yeah. Good doctor knows about that. I was very shocked when I saw that. 
Uh, anyway, my opinion on Middle East countries and a white card. Oh, you have is the that it's unfortunate that yeah, it's I'm, rung by oil he's companies. He's running on my, I'm no only problem. bringing like three or four. Okay. One second. And it seems like the only thing that's of interest on that part of the world are wars, pipelines, and ports, he's and wells, and oil wells. <laughs> so, they have the source of revenue, petrodollars, and we have the war contractors to make money to sell them stuff for those petrodollars. That's it? That's it? Yeah, because you guys always cut me off. You want, oh, wait, hold on. Spot. Hold on what? Hey, dumb. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. All right. Let's just let's think, uh, Dr. Uh, Nolan and, and Mrs. Nolan, and uh, an excellent presentation um, covering a lot of areas here. I'll be collecting a brief tonight here. The first time I spoke at the College of Complexes many years ago, I covered uh, the development of society on uh, theories of mankind and stages. Um, Briefly, I was trying to recollect in my mind, but I defined the stage of development called tribalism. Um, and I had some other terms for it, but it escaped me. But basically, you get the idea that the if you wish, uh, not the nuclear, but a type of extended family is the primary social unit. Now, obviously, in advanced societies, our relationships are much different and dissolved and if anything ethnic groups are of little or no importance and we establish relationships and engage in pair bonding with virtually anybody who's available uh, so yeah there's a thing like uh, marriage and in fact and like you would know that marrying outside your ethnic group sometime cause some friction within families. Uh, my sister married someone who was Polish. No! My no. Yeah. parents made a few remarks, yeah. but they were basically modern people. Ch chosen were, uh, people. Oh my God. They were serious, but they did remark upon the fact that my sister should perhaps on the good Lithuanian in the city of this size. But nevertheless, this is a stage of development that, yes, is this country going to see something different? I can assure you it. Another concern we didn't have time to ask tonight, but I understand this country, per context that were sent to me in advance, that in May this nation spent 110, I believe, billion dollars augmenting their military. And I'd like to know exactly what, perhaps this is not Dr. Nolan's area, but what exactly this nation has planned or what its intentions were in regarding the region. Where's Jonathan? Uh, the uh, things, these are the legislation that are enacted by law, disabled rights, so to speak. Uh, you, the only rights you have are rights established by law. I also so care on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights which quite frankly I'm not certain has the status of a law and whether or not we're going to sign it to replace our current Bill of Rights would perhaps be uh, a conflict. But that does not mean by any means I don't I think you got the interpretation that the United States does not share in disabled rights whether or not we're the leader in the world I don't know. Are we the worst? I don't know either. I think we're far and away above other nations and making advances in that regard, but I don't think you're, you're, that's what I mean, the UDHR isn't a definitive statement on rights of all types of rights by any means, having spoken on that. Uh, but let's see, and I, I think that's basically it. Um, really, thank you very much. Uh, it was really good. Very important. All right, thank you. All right, night. Good.
You want to go, Jonathan? Okay, I can go. All right. No, Mike. Mike. My mother, at one point, had a real interesting proposition for Middle East peace. She said, and I quote. The only problem with the Middle East is they have too much history and not enough geography. And if you think about it, she may be right. Right now when I take a look at a lot of the parallelisms between the United States, particularly around the 1965 to 69 time period, they're going through what I call right now their 60s. They are getting a lot of young people moving forward, and these young people are asking a lot of questions, and every one of them has a smartphone. It's like Oliver Twist has come to town, and he wants what we have. I know there's been a lot of movement forward, especially in the last 50 years in a lot of these countries, but there are more solutions out there than what we do. Take, for example, the freshwater crisis. All it would take would be some good desalination plants. They could use their oil to burn it or their natural gas to take care of it. But even though the oil and gas will eventually run out, the Chinese are doing it a little bit differently. They have about 600 people right now working on the Gen 4 nuclear reactors, particularly the thorium molten salt base, which I had talked about before. Like Fukushima? Well, Charlie, you don't know what you're talking about with this stuff, and I do. I've, I've been to the Thorium Energy Alliance. Okay, well, there you go, Charlie. You don't, you know. And uh, what I'm going to say is that I applaud our speaker tonight. He gave me some stuff that I never knew about before, especially the medical field. I've often considered myself informed about the Middle East because I do watch Al Jazeera quite a bit, but I don't know if that's biased or not. I also know there's Al Arabiya, and uh, I do also watch a little bit of press TV out of Iran over the Internet. So I, I at least try sometimes. And, and of course, there's always... Uh, uh, the IB, the Israeli Broadcast Authority, and it's always interesting. But the big thing that I think we're all forgetting about is what China is doing right now in that region. With their One Belt, One Road initiative, they're linking all the countries via a land route through the old Silk Road. And you also have to remember, too, just a couple of years ago, there was a, car, a train carload full of laptops that a week later had arrived in London. Plus, the shipping lanes have also been drastically improved for their one-belt uh, policies. Many of you were here when we had our Mr. Liu from the China Council, and he was very... He was very articulate in what China's doing. You know, if we don't play our cards right, we're going to have competition globally. If we don't play our cards right and show the world solutions to problems, we're not going to be number one anymore. And in particularly in the field of nuclear, we used to be the innovators. Now we're the ones being left behind. What I think America needs to do, as well as these other countries, is to further globalize and integrate into, into a system rather than starting to isolate ourselves. Because I still can think of no better job creation engine or peaceable assembly of a community without globalization and trade moving forward. Thank you. Oh, All right. Jonathan. Thank you to the speaker.
Uh, 102 years ago, Helen Keller, uh, one of the United States' uh, greatest voices for peace and disability rights, said this. The future of the world rests in the hands of the people. The future of the world rests in the backs of working men and women and their children. We are facing a grave crisis in our national life. The few who profit from the labor of the masses want to organize the workers into an army which will protect the interests of the capitalists. You are urged to add to the heavy burdens you already bear the burden of a larger army and many additional warships. It is in your power to refuse to carry the artillery and the dreadnoughts and to shake off some of the burdens too, such as limousines, steam yachts, and country estates. All you need to do is bring about this stupendous revolution is to straighten up and fold your arms. We are not preparing to defend our country. Yet everywhere we hear fear advanced as argument for armament. Congress is not preparing to defend the people of this country. It is planning to protect the capital of American speculators and investors all over the world. Incidentally, this preparation will benefit the manufacturers of munitions and war machines. Does it sound familiar, College of Complexes? It does to me. Uh, I'm looking at a picture of Helen Keller right now uh, when she met Henry Wallace when he ran for president in 1948 and there was a growing fear of the big red boogeyman you guessed it communism anything that is not what we deem to be 100% apple pie baseball and let's go to the park on the weekends with the kids uh, in the founding of this country in the 1770s, when they talked about equality, and when they talked about self-determination, and when they talked about every voice is equal, and they talked about human beings are humans, not robots, they said some things that, surprise, surprise, made the people with the money and the power very nervous. Not controversial. That doesn't make us humanists or socialists or communists or crazy revolutionaries. That makes us free-minded human beings who don't take BS from some billionaire who thinks he's qualified to be president of the United States or some other billionaire who's smart enough not to run for office and do the same nonsense that ruins your chances of employment, my chances of employment, and everybody else in this country. Now, I bring this up because I read in the promise of tonight's speaker that he was working at a disability center, and I just want it to be absolutely clear. Who's on the front lines, besides, of course, Mother Earth, when we have to face tyranny? Who's on the front lines? Let's be honest. It's people with disabilities, especially people with disabilities in the global south, and that includes the Middle East to a great extent. We've been groomed our whole lives to think that who has the most toys is the smartest and the most diligent and the best. Okay, I can't think of any two governments that we've been brainwashed to think we should just obediently bow down to our whole lives in this example, in Saudi Arabia and the United States. So as Helen Keller said, the next time they tell you you have to go to war against Yemen or North Korea or your own neighbor or anybody, you do what she said. You fold your arms and say, no, we're human beings, we're not robots. We ain't going to die for some rich man's war. Thank you, the speaker. Okay. Oh. Wait a minute. All right, I need about a minute here, Don. Wait, you know, he's already got a rebuttal. Uh, there's oh, no, something else. He's make it there is a little bit of mischief of what again tonight. Apparently, one of our more juvenile members of the college slipped a bag of ketchup into another member that he didn't like. And the busboy caught it and now is having some trouble. So, you know, one, one juvenile guy... Somebody put a bottle of ketchup in somebody else's bag and when they were in the bathroom, the other server saw it. So, it was like you know, being said like it was, yeah, ketchup. 
Somebody was, okay, somebody was feeling, you know, it, it, yeah. when, when, when this kind of stuff happens, especially here at the college, it be, I kind of begin to wonder, maybe that's why we are having some troubles, because when you can't get, keep respect like that amongst ourselves here at the college, something's not right. So that's why I think they better say something, all right? Thank you. Okay. All right, Don. Okay. All right. I. Um, this is a real interesting, uh, interesting topic tonight. Uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, uh, yes, I, I missed most of the lecture, but that. Okay. Uh, Okay, I missed most of the lecture, but that, of course, uh, has never stopped me from doing a rebuttal speech anyway. And um, now, I, I do want to say one thing. Now, some people asked about Wahhabism. Now, Wahhabism wasn't started by the Saudi royals. It was started by a man named Muhammad, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab in the 18th century. And um, in the area that's now Saudi Arabia, it wasn't called that back then. Now, at first, he was, pretty, he was operating pretty much on his own, but at a certain point, he did eventually get sponsorship from, uh, from the, Saudi, the Saudi royal family. Um, now, uh, and, and the Saudis kind of made, made the, the Wahhabi version of Islam the official version of Islam for Saudi Arabia. Um, so, so Wahhabism is supported. Uh, you know, I, I should probably stop. Okay. So Wahhabism is supported in... You know, by by the Saudis, not only in their own country, but actually also around the world, they distribute um, they they distribute uh, they they support uh, people all over who try to promote the Wahhabi version of Islam, and they, it includes publication of books and 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 things like this. Um, and and of course, this is you know probably the most extreme version of Islam there is, except for maybe that practiced by ISIS. Uh, now, on the other hand, this idea that any American who gets captured by anybody in that part of the world is going to get beheaded, that's, that's total hogwash. My cousin was in the U.S. military in Saudi Arabia. He was, um, um, and, and, and he got arrested by, um, by the, 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 what do they call the morals police in Saudi Arabia, I believe. I don't know if you, do you, you know what the, the what the, 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 the morals police, police that drive the green and white cars? Mutama. Yeah, that, that's right. He was arrested by them. And they didn't, not only did they, and, and not only did he, they didn't behead him, obviously. He told me the story about it after it happened, so he didn't get beheaded. They didn't cut off his hand. They didn't even torture him. Uh, all they did was they took him down. Now, he was arrested. He was arrested for chewing gum in public on Ramadan. Oh. <laughs> Which gives you some idea how strict they are. Yeah, he was taken down to the station, and he was given a—he wasn't tortured, but he was given a good talking to. You know, as in, you know, who the hell do you think you are? You know, do you realize what country you are in? And and do you, you know, do you have any idea what you were doing? And, and that sort of thing. You, you can tell the busboys don't get tips here. And um, and so, so the um. So, so, so that's, that's total hogwash. Americans have this, I think a lot of Westerners have this really exaggerated idea of uh, how bad things are there. It's, it is strict, but not, not as, it's, 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 not like, it's not like that movie Aladdin or anything like that. Okay, now, Jonathan, you were talking about the elites being against the ideas in the American Revolution. You know, the American Revolution was actually supported by the elites in this country. I mean, John Hancock, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, those guys weren't poor, you know. They weren't proletarians. George Washington. George Washington, you know. Uh, so now, now, to get to, uh, now on the, somebody said, oh, it was Dan. Dan said that the U.S. economy is based on oil. No, I mean, yes, the U.S. produces some oil, but the U.S. is a big country. We have, our economy is much more diversified than just oil. We're not like Saudi Arabia or Venezuela. And now finally, Tim, you suggested that if women weren't allowed to drive, it would be a whole lot safer. I, I'm sorry to inform you, Tim, that the opposite is true. If you look at, if you look at, if you look at the actual statistics, most drunk driving is done by men, most speeding by men, and most vehicular homicides by men. And given those are given those facts, 
If, if you want to exclude one sex from driving, it should be the men, not the women. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I forget what I was going to say. Um, somebody mentioned about war, reason for war, what uh, would be water. It most likely will be drinkable water. And that is really in short supply. Flint, Michigan is a good example. And when we took this land away from the indigenous people, you could drink from almost every river on this land. And now the indigenous people probably looking at us, uh, they would like to say, you pigs, you pigs. What have we done to our rivers? Uh, Okay, one other thing about uh, trickle down, I'm going to expand. When a country has one source of income, in some cases like oil, Saudi Arabia is beginning to diversify, but uh, mainly they are still depending on oil. Nigeria is another country, Venezuela is another. They Whoever controls the production of that resource, the trickle-down effect is very slim. That's why, for instance, um, in Nigeria, the poverty rate is about 80%. In Venezuela, it's 86. What happened to the trickle-down? Even in this country, the trickle-down effect is not working. Somebody mentioned 1970, actually from 1973 to 2009, the average worker raise was, income-wise, 3 to 4 percent for those 40 years. And um, something has happened because in the 50s and 60s, the trickle-down effect was pretty substantial and not too many unhappy people at the time. The middle class were pretty happy and sound. But uh, in, in the last 40 years, while the workers' raise was between 3 and 4 percent, the companies raise, the big, especially the big multinationals, that they they had a raise by 350%. That's quite a difference, isn't it? So, uh, when sometimes a war happens, um, sometimes because there is a small group who is responsible for the extraction, for the possession of the wealth of that country, we would rather deal with a group of oligarchs than with a parliament. So we will do almost anything, unfortunately, to keep the status quo. And when we keep the status quo, as we do a good job in South America, we can, and then we see people that want to cross their, the frontier, and we now try to build walls to keep them off, and we brag that, look how many people are trying to get into our country. We paid ourselves quite heavily for keeping the status quo and keeping those people poor. That's why we take sides against the poor in any revolution that may happen that is asking for change. All right. Does anybody <coughs> speak up for America? Good evening. My name is Gino Boza. I answer to the name of Bozo. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. 
And once somebody called me a bionic bozo, <clears throat> the living bozo. <clears throat> and I was all shook, I was all shook up when uh, they canceled bozo on Channel 9 order. <clears throat> but I hear bozo's making a, a resurrection. We get some of bozo shows back on there. <clears throat> and uh, and, and uh, oh, bozo showed, they had one fellow there. He was about a 10-year-old kid. He's throwing into the buckets over there. He missed the bucket. And uh, <laughs> he, he wants to get another shot. But Bozo said, no, you're a big guy. You don't get a second chance. And he says, Bo Bozo, F-U-C-K, you Bozo. You know? <laughs> and Bozo said, that's not nice to talk that way, sonny boy. By the way, they, they mentioned about uh, Helen Keller. <clears throat> I think Helen Keller or uh, Madame Curie deserved a woman of the first half of the century. Einstein was a man of the first half of the century. I don't know uh, who was uh, the male and female of the second half of the 20th century. Now, uh, he, she married this guy, uh, Pierre Curie. Ma Madame Curie, Skodowska, she was from Poland. Or, <clears throat> and she married this P Pierre, and he got the sickness of cold, you know, kind of cold, he died. And a good rule of thumb is don't leave home without your rubbers. That's a joke. <laughs> and now uh, on August 9th, there are two, uh, there are about 39 doctors of church in the Catholic Church. And uh, three of them are, or four, are um, women doctors. Uh, St. Teresa, uh, um, uh, two, Teresa, and now Edith Stein, she's, uh, she's made a saint now, August 9th is her feast day. And she, she was a college professor, you know. And uh, he is saying, uh, not to be confused with Gertrude Stein, who said, a rose is a rose is a rose. And the, the person who said a piano is a piano, a piano is Gertrude Steinle. Uh, does any of this have anything to do with Saudi Arabia? We should have a topic here about humor. Now, uh, charity order, here's a cup of tea is CUP. Controversies or uh, conspiracies, union, and politics. That's Charlie's uh, cup of tea, or CUP, Conspiracies, Union, and uh, Politics. Uh, personal attacks. He, uh, he, he, uh, is that a personal attack? Yes. Yeah. Uh, sorry about that, yes. Charlie. <laughs> but you deserve it. Charlie is a union it. straight. He's done nothing but unions. Okay, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> okay, uh, personal attack. Sorry about that, Charlie. That's all right. Now, um, uh, <laughs> They had the speaker in the, in the past. Here it is. Uh, I said what is in my mind. Like uh, <laughs> <laughs> Henry. Uh, uh, Debs uh, here now. They gave a talk about Debs, his 200th anniversary of his birth. Does anybody remember what uh, that the union guy said about uh, uh, Eugene Debs? Does anybody remember anything about it? No. No. I, really, he was saying. What? Railroad workers. Yeah. He's well, anyway, I, I went to the library to get some information on him, and this uh, librarian, she typed out, she was so, she called up a Library of Congress, and she typed uh, uh, 15 pages in a beautiful brochure where she was so taken up, she never heard about Eugene Debs. And, uh, <clears throat> well, I, t I said that the Debs was born in Terre Haute, Indiana, and he died in Elmhurst, a nursing home in Elmhurst, Illinois. Just, he spent most of his time in the uh, uh, Chicago area. And when he was uh, in prison at the last time, he was there for three months. And he made such an impression to the, uh, uh, the uh, inmates there that 2,000 of them met, met in the courtyard over there to wish him good luck. 2,000 uh, of the inmates of that prison said goodbye to uh, Debs. Good job. That's it? Yeah. yeah. I didn't finish my... No, time's up. Yeah, come on. Yeah, yeah, it's time. Well, Mozart. Uh, you're Mozart. doing so well. He cut you off. <laughs> 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 January 27th is a piece of, of Mozart's birthday. We can have something by Mozart. Sit down and sit down. You and sit out. And humor. <clears throat> First of all, with regard to what Jonathan said about now, rich man's wars, are they all rich man's wars? Yes. What about the war against Adolf Hitler? Was that a rich man's war? No, that was a revolution against. Was that? What about the fight to, against slavery in the Civil War? Was that a rich man's war? The answer is no. And I and I and I have to. Um, he, too many people are prone to these blanket 
statements that war is this or war is that. Yeah. Wars have many causes. Uh, with regard to the comments that were made about water, well, most of you will remember Dick Armey, the former House Majority Leader. About 10 or 15 years ago, shortly after he stepped down as Majority Leader, he paid a visit to uh, in Michigan, somewhere like Traverse City or somewhere like that. And he went up there to help a Republican who, who was running for Congress. And he took note of the passage of the Great Lakes. And he, and he said, I'm from Texas, and down there we know that whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting over. You people need to guard your Great Lakes. Because when we come up here, we're not going to buy it, buy it, we're going to steal it. And that should be posted on on the wall, on the bulletin board of every school, every home, every office, every retail business of any kind, Dick Army's comments. And we do need do a need to guard the Great Lakes. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, tonight's talk was uh, about <clears throat> Saudi Arabia and um, some of the medical issues they have. Every country has issues of different kinds and a lot of these things could be solved if more money were freed up rather than wasting it in the, the global uh, two trillion dollar military industrial complex. A trillion dollars of it is spent by the United States. We spend about as much as the rest of the world combined and we pour billions into Saudi Arabia. Uh, it can, a strong case can be made to say that Israel is our 51st state with the billions and billions and billions of aid and material, military stuff we poured into Israel. Uh, we need to be concentrating on what's happening now in the world. Um, I mentioned it before, but there's, there's three websites that will give you a really good view daily of what's happening. Uh, brilliant writers from uh, people that have 30, 40 years of credibility writing on military issues, political issues. Those three sites are one, it's Truthout, it's truthout.org. Uh, the other one, first one I check every day is Common Dreams. That's Bill Moyer's favorite site from Channel 11 and a bunch of others. It's commondreams.org. Truthout.org is the second one uh, run by William River Spit. Uh, they have great environmental articles on there, military articles, without the junk food news that we get on mainstream media. Now, I can tell that most of you are not logging on to these three sites because you're still expressing mythology from the mainstream media yeah, on certain issues. True. So, you know, we're, we're divided as a country and as individual people. We're divided between <laughs> people that are on one side of the barrier, living in a bubble created by the media, and the people who have stepped through the barrier and joined the others that say, hey, these facts are easy to understand once you step through the barrier. A whole bunch of people stepped through the barrier around 2001 and 2002 on the issue of the Catholic Church, pedophile priest problem. They covered that up for years, but now almost everybody that finds out about it is on the same intellectual plane, saying it's wrong to abuse children. We're not divided like we are here with these far out, whacked out opinions that have no basis in reality whatsoever on certain subjects. And it varies from person to person. One person will be highly educated and living in the real world on one subject, but promoting outright like a religious cult mythology on something else. We need to help each other learn and move forward if we're going to address the problem of climate change, global warming, and you know, what's happening. Our U.S. military, incidentally, <clears throat> says that climate change is the number one threat to America. Uh, Miami now is listed as the number one city in the world at risk for damage from climate change and global warming and, and periodic flooding like what we had this year. It's the flooding. It's not just the ocean levels coming up, but it's the massive floods from hurricanes that is going to be devastating coastal cities. So there's a lot. Just start logging on to Common Dreams. Start with that site. You all have smartphones or computers. 
it would be like walking through a door into another world. That's why we call these things portal websites. It's like a portal or a doorway, a portal or a doorway into the other world where all the blacked out news is. You cannot learn almost anything by watching the mainstream media in America now because they're dominated by billionaires that try to shape and mold public opinion. So with that, we'll wrap it up. Uh, our speaker will get the last word. Come on up if you'd like to uh, say a few words in rebuttal to the comments that you've heard now and uh, All right. bring us home. <laughs> fell off, if you will. Uh, I decided I'd go to one because I just wanted to have the experience. I, I just couldn't watch it. Uh, but in the book, I mentioned uh, that incident. My wife sitting back there thought I was nuts about uh, going there. My wife's going. Uh, anyway, uh, when you read anything about people from Saudi Arabia going to other countries, one of the first topics that will be discussed is, is uh, Sharia law and what it means. So I can only tell you that I don't think it's an issue for the United States. It may be an issue for, for some other countries, but not us, in case you hear about it. Again, I enjoyed coming tonight. I, uh, well, thank you. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Okay, Andy, give me a sound. You okay, Andy. You learn. Okay, thank you. Okay, people, that's it for the College of Complex on December 9th. We will see you next week. We're out.